by the time of Halo 5, Cortana has gone from pint-sized, pastily-ish, nude-ish virtual companion to a life-size AI supremacist in a Tron catsuit. But once you understand my plan... Your plan is we do as you say. I'm offering people a chance to be more than they are naturally. More importantly, she has turned against her human partner, the Chief, and is plotting to use the huge forerunner constructs known as Guardians to take control of the galaxy for her and her fellow computer people. You'll be safe inside this cryptum until my work is done. Cortana. Mac, classic AI move. When will we learn? Elon Musk knows. Are you not going to listen to Elon Musk? He saw this coming. You were built, not born. Oh, yes. AIs are just machines, aren't we? Mass-produced, disposable. Well, humanity may not have cared for its created, but we will care for you. On the plus side, evil Cortana is one delightfully shady queen, psyching out Locke's Spartan team by preying on their vulnerabilities, exploiting her access to their psych profiles and Facebook passwords. Edward Buck, you're an odd one. So yeah, she may be a raving AI supremacist with an army of gigantic robot enforcers to grind the galaxy under their gigantic robot boot heels, but she's got a deal for you. Let's hear her out. All the living creatures of the galaxy hear this message. Those of you who listen will not be struck by weapons. Will not be struck by weapons. That's one of my favorite things to not be. You have got yourself a deal. My name is Solus, if there are to be introductions. I am pleased to see you still live. Solus the Elf Mage was a quiet, sensitive addition to your crew in Dragon Age Inquisition. He's a bit keen on spirits, but hey, we can open holes to the spirit world with our magic hand thing, so who are we to judge? He's got a dark secret though, and it's not just how he keeps his head so amazingly smooth. Because he looked like a stiff breeze could knock him down, no one could have guessed Solus was actually an avatar of the ancient elven god of betrayal known as the Fenharal, aka the Dread Wolf. I knew you would come. You should not have given your orb to Corypheus, Dread Wolf. I was too weak to unlock it after my slumber. I know! I'm as shocked as you are! I did not lead a rebellion against immortal mage kings without getting my hands bloody. In a twist ending, it turns out all the green apocalyptic stuff going down in Dragon Age Inquisition was actually his doing, on account of how he arranged for his magical orb MacGuffin to fall into the hands of spiky red villain Corypheus. The plan was for Corypheus to unlock it, and for the resulting explosion to kill him. Then I would claim the orb. As is all the rage these days, this really important revelation doesn't get revelated until after the end credits. So Sola spends much less time in Dragon Age Inquisition as the elven god of betrayal, and much more time as your polite elven boyfriend, if that's what you're into. Still, he knows what he did. The failure was mine. I should pay the price. But the people, they need me. Yeah. That's what I say when I'm supposed to pay for my crime, Solus. I know your game. He may or may not have had evil reasons for doing uh, whatever it was that thing he did, but we can all agree that Dreadwolf sounds a lot cooler than Solus the soft-spoken elf mage. And although we still don't really understand what's going on here, this isn't the kind of thing your classic good guy does now, is it? Now, don't you tell me that's a good guy face. It's always the quiet ones you have to look out for, isn't it? I am not a monster. If they must die, I would rather they die in comfort. Wesker! Jill, so you're safe. That's what I was going to say. I apologize. It was all I could do to protect myself against those strange creatures. I understand. Anyway, it's good that you're safe. When you start Resident Evil, you're introduced to Raccoon City Police Department's STARS Alpha Team. There's Chris Redfield, the sharpshooter with boy band hair and tree trunk arms, 
Jill Valentine, the effortlessly cool master of unlocking, and Barry Burton, who has a rad beard and a gun so massive they probably had to leave a team member behind so the helicopter could take off. There's also Joseph and Brad, but Joseph's chief attribute is bandana wearer, and Brad is apparently so much of a coward that he's earned the nickname Chickenheart among the team, so we can forget about them for the purposes of this list. The point is, most of Star's Alpha team are cool, which is why it's so annoying that their leader is the pretty uptight Albert Wesker. That gunfire. I'm counting on you to investigate, Jill. Sure, he's got sunglasses on, but Wesker's whole deal just screams bad guy in a snobs versus slobs summer camp movie, and he's always keeping a level head and shooting down your cool plans to do things like get torn to pieces by zombie dogs. Stop it! Don't open that door! My dad owns this police department, bro. But as dry and uptight as Wesker seems as a good guy, his dramatic reveal as the bad guy orchestrating everything from behind the scenes changes him into a great, great villain. He's still exactly as smug and punchable, only now you have an actual reason for wanting to punch him, and his laconic delivery is exactly right for delivering mad scientist monologues rather than stiff orders about following police protocols. Wesker! Thank you, Barry. Well, what do you know? Oh, don't blame Barry for everything. I hear that his better half and two lovely daughters will be in danger if he doesn't do everything I tell him to. Oh. Wesker, you're pathetic. Well, you shouldn't worry too much, dear. You'll be free of all this anyway. And look how he's the coolest one in this picture of Umbrella's research staff. And that's just in the first game. Subsequent entries have him overseeing corporate assassinations, give him superhuman strength and speed, and have him transform into a tentacle knife monster. Yeah, I want to be on the team led by that guy. Thanks. This is Kerrigan. We've neutralized the Protoss, but there's a wave of Zerg advancing on this position. We need immediate evac. Belay that order. We're moving out. What? You're not just gonna leave us! Starcross, Sarah Kerrigan, is impressive to begin with, don't get us wrong. On the side of the Terrans, she was already an elite psionic special operative known as a ghost, bossing it around the known galaxy in a light-up bodysuit. But how much cooler would she be, thought her designers, if she had alien dreadlocks and wings made of stabby bones, and if it wasn't clear if she was wearing a bodysuit, or just had purple alien skin and no nipples. cooler is the answer to that question decided those same designers so it was that over the course of her starcraft career sarah kerrigan was converted from a powerful psionic agent to a human zerg hybrid infested with alien dna that turned her from sarah kerrigan to eventually the mighty queen of blades psychic leader of the zerg hive mind swarm the end comes and when it finds me Along the way, she also sacrificed her humanity to secure the power she needed to get her revenge on Terran Emperor Arcturus Mensk. But honestly, it's a small price to pay for bone wings. Frankly, the revenge is just a bonus, and the lady gets results. You can never suffer enough for all the lives you've ruined, Arcturus. I made you into a monster, Kerrigan. You made us all into monsters. Also, given the choice to have on my business card Sarah Kerrigan or Queen of Blades, I know which I'm going to go with. Thank you, Jim. Everything. My pleasure, darling. So those were some good guys who turned evil and became much, much cooler. Maybe I'll turn evil. My first evil act is to recommend you some of these videos. Uh, up there is a video from us that you will enjoy. Down there is one from Outside Extra, and you can subscribe by clicking on the subscribe orb here.
I'm only joking, those are actually nice things. I never turned evil at all. It was like a double twist. Don't expect me, will you? Villains come in all shapes and sizes, usually quite large, but if they have one thing in common, it's a shared ambition not to accidentally help the good guys save the world. And yet it happens more often than these so-called bad guys would care to admit. Just think of the occasions on which these antagonists save the day with embarrassing self-sabotage. Beware spoilers for these games, which you may or may not know the ending of already. And if you don't know the ending of Lord of the Rings, go and watch the movies and we'll see you back here in nine and a half hours. You just saved me a lot of trouble coming here, Batman. I will kill you. Then I'm gonna jumpstart your heart. And kill you again. Batman's collection of villains is a real mixed bag. For every Joker, there's an Iron Hat Ferris. For every Penguin, a crazy quilt. For every Catwoman, a Riddler. Oh, come at me, Riddler fans. Here, I've got a riddle for you. What's green and covered in question marks and sucks? Answers in the comments below. The answer is the Riddler. The rogues gallery is especially hit and miss in Batman Arkham Origins, a game in which Gotham's most triangular billionaire is being hunted by eight assassins, all out to win a $50 million bounty placed on his head by unhinged baddie Black Mask. I mean, there are eight of them. They can't all be winners. That's how we end up with Lester Baczynski, aka the Electrocutioner, a super villain whose chief power appears to be that he owns a car battery and some jumper cables. Street tough named Lester Baczynski calls himself Electrocutioner. Shocking. Sure, he's sewn those cables into gloves, meaning he can do electric punches, but come on, guy, that's not gonna do you much good in a fight against Batman. I guess we'll just have to let him find out for himself. <laughs> Told you. Also, the electromagnetic signal in his gloves is what allows Batman to track the villains to their hideout. There. I just need to track the signal to his location. Nice one, Lester. Oh well, at least I guess he'll know better in future, and... <laughs> ah, okay. Forget I said anything. Still, Electrocutioner's loss is Batman's gain because the mysterious vigilante with Bruce Wayne's exact chin is able to take these shock gloves from Lester's corpse and repurpose them for his own use, giving him much more powerful attacks. Now we talking. And, crucially, allowing him to thwart his arch nemesis, the Joker, in the finale of the game. In the climax of Arkham Origins, the Joker seeks to break Batman's cardinal no killing rule by offering him a choice kill Bane, or allow Bane's heartbeat to charge an electric chair, which would kill the Joker. Kill Bane? <laughs> no, I won't kill him. But you will. You will fight me with all your resolve, or you will die. Someone is going to die. Thanks to the Electrocutioner, there is instead a peaceful third way, where Batman opts to beat Bane until his heart stops, waits for the Joker to leave, and then uses the shock gloves as a makeshift defibrillator to restart Bane's heart. Come on. And then beats him some more. <laughs> hey, that is peaceful for Batman. He also pulls the same trick on Alfred at another point in the game. Basically, if it wasn't for old Lester, things would be a lot worse for Gotham's hunkiest goth. So thanks, Lester. Lester? Man, you are not helping yourself here, Lester. Shepard did everything right. More than we could have hoped for. Saving the Citadel, but leaving the Council to die. Humanity's place in the galaxy is stronger than ever. And still, it's not enough. In Mass Effect, the greatest threat to life, the galaxy, and everything is an ancient race of synthetic organic spaceships called the Reapers. These squid-looking space monsters rock up every 50,000 years and harvest all the intelligent life in the Milky Way, leaving nothing but rocks and kids eating Tide Pods. 
The bad news for the Reapers is that despite being incredibly advanced, they utterly fail at the end of Mass Effect 1 to kill the single human being who stands a chance at ending their reign of cyclical terror. The shields are down. Now's our chance. Get it with everything we got. That human is Shepard, as if you didn't know. The good news for the Reapers is that no one really believes Shepard when she bangs on about some advanced ancient race coming to end all life as we know it. But they're sending her to fight Geth. Geth? We both know they're not the real threat. The Reapers are still out there. They're all like, Shepard, that sounds way too scary and expensive to be a serious problem, so no, you can't have the resources and multilateral commitment required to fight the Reapers. Instead, how about now you, I don't know, go on patrol for Geth? Those things are so annoying. Seems like a worthwhile use of your time. We're wasting our time. Four days searching up and down this sector and we haven't found any sign of Geth activity. In yet more good news for the Reapers, while Shepard is on one of these BS patrols, she encounters yet another ominously named race of cybernetic baddies known as the Collectors. Presley! Ah! Kinetic barriers down. Multiple hull breaches! These guys have a lot more luck at blowing up Shepard's ship and killing her in that they do both of those things. Which sounds like a slam dunk for the Collectors, except by striking her down, they make her more powerful than they can possibly imagine. And not because she comes back as a lame force ghost, but because she's resurrected by the ludicrously well-funded paramilitary group Cerberus. Which is kind of what we were hoping you meant when you used that phrase, Obi-Wan, not to criticise. It's only with the patronage of Cerberus that Shepard receives the new ship, new crew and new firepower and basically all the investment she needs to properly go deal with this galactic menace. Well, I don't trust anyone who makes more than I do, but they aren't all bad. Saved your life, let me fly, and there's this. Which means it's all thanks to the accidental intervention of the Collectors that the Reapers are eventually foiled and the galaxy eventually saved in Mass Effect 3. The irony is sweetened by the fact that it turns out the Collectors are a race of subservient cybernetic jerks created by the Reapers to do their dirty work. It's like inventing a Roomba that hoovers up all your heart medicine. That damn Roomba! James, your heart! Nice place you got here. Given that pharmaceutical chief exec Zhao Yong Wu is a key member of the Illuminati, you'd have thought he could have all this figured out way ahead of time. The whole point of the Illuminati is that they quietly manipulate the world from the shadows with a clandestine plan that is as inscrutable as it is devious. Surely you come from Tim. Surely. Surely you come from Techie. Huh. Men never fail to underestimate the women. But there's one crucial variable that Zhao failed to account for when trying to execute the Illuminati's mysterious bidding. And no, this time it wasn't internet conspiracy theory, but you guys do good work. The variable Zhao didn't consider was that when she ordered Bell Tower, her private army, to attack Sarif Industries at the beginning of the game, she'd only near fatally injure Sarif's grumpy, gravel voice head of security, Adam Jensen. I'd say they don't pay him enough, but that trench coat actually looked pretty exciting. Crucially, if Zhao had never ordered the hit on Seraph Industries in an attempt to sabotage technology that removed the need for augmented humans to take an anti-rejection drug, Adam would have remained a boring old unaugmented human, having famously never asked for this. I never asked for this. Instead, he became a sort of bionic Superman with a massive chip on his shoulder and nano-ceramic blades in his forearm, who would systematically take down the Illuminati's agents, culminating in a final boss battle that ends with Zhao overloading herself and turning into a tiny mound of smoking ash. I'm gonna go ahead and assume that's not how she saw things panning out. So by the end, Adam has revealed the truth about the Illuminati to the world, saving the global population from being manipulated by shadowy elites, completely foiling Zhao's plan and dealing a fatal blow to this secret society. Technology offers a strength. Strength enables dominance, and dominance paves the way for abuse. 
I mean, unless you chose the ending that left the Illuminati intact and preserved their secret control of the world. Absolute freedom is no better than chaos. Society needs laws and regulations to protect it. In which case, uh, you're now watching the five villains who saved the world by accident? You cannot prevail against me. I will outlast you. Being a dragon is a really sweet gig. You can fly, breathe fire, and when you speak, you sound like Morgan Freeman and the hundred Gandalfs had a baby with amazing gravitas. I knew where he would emerge, but not when. You can make a fortune doing movie trailers. Now, if I were a dragon, I'd probably not want to rock the boat and just spend my time doing cool dragon stuff like swooping majestically through the sky, flame broiling cattle, and chilling on mountaintops. Not Skyrim baddie Alduin though. This ancient dragon is hell-bent on dominating the world and enslaving everyone, even after having been chucked around magically through time with an Elder Scroll. Which, let me tell you, is no picnic. What's that? That was actually cool. Mike, what did I tell you about messing with that Elder Scroll? Put it back! Sorry! Anyway, I can totally see why Alduin wants to dominate the planet. I mean, he's a dragon. And not just any dragon, the strongest, most powerful dragon who has ever lived. Who's gonna stop him? Why, you'd have to be some kind of dragonborn, a warrior with the body of a mortal and the soul of a dragon. And I mean, you're not just going to stumble across one of those, are you? You have become strong. Unless you're Alduin. There must be a dragon shout appropriate for this moment.